G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to part two out of five of our survival video series. Today we're going into protection and location. I'll explain that a bit later. If you haven't seen part one of this survival video series, I recommend you go and check it out. Ultimately, everything that we're covering in the series includes the rules of survival, which was the last video. Check it out, link below or card top right. We then are going on to protection and location, which is what we're going to cover today. Then in following videos, we're going to go over water and food, which is in fact not as simple as it seems and also not the first part of survival. A warning to everyone out there, today we are talking about survival, therefore I'm not here to protect your feelings, I'm here to protect your life. Consequently, I remind you that survival doesn't care about your feelings. So if I say something that upsets you, too bad. I'm not here to offend you. I'm here to save you. There are different settings, locations and times and privileges where you can choose to be offended. And if you believe an important part of survival is not being offended, I suggest that you click off because this is about truth, logic, reason and reality. Again, I'm not here to protect your feelings. I'm here to protect your life. And as such, I will likely say something that could be confronting to anyone who's a first world privileged snowflake. So let's just quickly revise the rules of survival. Firstly, you want to do what's hard when it's easy. Secondly, failing to plan is planning to fail. Three, alliances dominate. Four, agility and mobility is key. Five, no one is coming to save you. Six, there is no social justice in survival. Seven, the weak are liabilities. Eight, survival does not care about your feelings. If you have seen part one of this series, I hope you got some value out of it. And I do appreciate some of the very powerful comments that I received in return, all positive, even though there were some very confronting facts in there. If you haven't seen that video, again, check out the link below because I think it's very important you watch. Okay, let's get into it. So as I mentioned, we have to kind of combine protection and location into the one video. And that's because when it comes to protection, you kind of have to figure out where you are. So noting this series is more about urban survival, like living in your house or living in an urban area where you're forced into a survival situation, as opposed to going out bush and getting into the Bear grill situation. I can teach you about that, but that's not really what this series is about. This series is about the reality that we live in at the moment, that being a modern world. And when the poo hits the fan and water stops flowing, electricity is shut off, riots break out, and you're in a survival situation, the first step is to understand what will kill you. When I talk about the environment, allow me to give you an extreme example. If I drop you in the snow without any clothes, the first thing that is likely going to kill you isn't flying bullets, isn't an angry bear, isn't starvation, it's likely exposure and hypothermia. Conversely, if I drop you in the desert naked, you're likely going to be at risk of hyperthermia, exposure, sunstroke, dehydration, and so forth. If I'm in an earthquake, you might like to think of falling objects or crushing objects, such as buildings falling apart around you, highways collapsing underneath you, walls falling down, or even a panicking crowd running. Sometimes one of the greatest dangers is everyone else around you panicking from the same danger. A quick case study would be that of what happened in South Korea recently. During festivities on the street, there was no earthquake. There was no flood, there was no fire. People just crushed each other as too many people were in the one place at once, which kind of links to a being. What will kill you first? Could it be other people crushing you? Could it be someone violent? Could it be that bear in the woods? Could it be a drunk driver? The first part of understanding survival when it comes to protection and location is considering what will kill you. This leads to where are you? So I gave examples of what environment you're in. And there was one survival case study which was quite tragic where a snowboarder in Australia froze to death in the snow. So basically he went off a trail, he went snowboarding where no one else was. He then went missing, lost, and later found dead just 200 meters away from a snow cabin. 200 meters away from survival. He lost his bearings and a 200 meter walk for an able-bodied fit young man is no big deal even if you're very hungry, tired and sore, when it's a matter of life and death, walking from your frozen demise to an open fire in a lodge is the difference between life and death. And that's why when it comes to protection, you can see where you have to kind of marry it up with location. You have to consider where you are and what will kill you so you can consider your next move. And that actually links to where to move. Sometimes in danger, believe it or not, you actually want to move towards it. Anyone who has served in the infantry, you know the motto that starts off to seek out and close with the enemy. Concurrently, 
if you understand in combat, counter ambush drills don't involve you running away from the fight, but rather running towards it. Not to be a hero, but because statistically, when a hail of bullets opens towards you in an ambush type scenario, you are more likely to live running towards that ambush site than running away from it. You're never going to outrun a bullet, but if you can move into the kill group and on the other side or online with where those bullets are coming from, you increase your chances of survival. Equally, when it comes to moving, if you saw a car coming towards you and you're a pedestrian, running away from that car is probably going to do very little. You may not necessarily want to move towards that car, but moving out of its path is a consideration. Then when you get onto wild animals, there are very few wild animals you're going to outrun. Sometimes the key is not to move at all. For example, if you saw my Doberman sprinting towards you, my best advice is do not move. If you run, she will get you. If you stay still, she'll come up to you and just bark like crazy until you flinch. Most dog handlers understand this and they will tell the person who is under attack per se, don't move. When you think of your survival in a violent situation, beyond an ambush, depending who you are and depending on the situation, sometimes if someone is threatening you or punching on with you, the best thing for you to do is move towards that and close out with that enemy. Story time with Uncle Adam. One time I was at university and I was king hit from behind. It was a mistaken identity. And my reaction, having served in a combat role, was move forward on the enemy. I don't know, I don't recall consciously thinking this, rather it was a reaction from my training. So as a result, I immediately turned around, grabbed the person by the throat, charged forward, they lost the balance, I gained the initiative, they fell over backwards, I'm on top of them, the rest is history. Had I moved away, that would have given that perpetrator more time to hit me further, and I probably would have been in a world of hurt. This is a very fine balancing act. It helps when you're 6'3", 110 kilos, and you have a lot of training behind you. But that doesn't mean the solution is black and white. That is, should I always move forward? Should I always pull back? Or should I just be stationary? It kind of links to the prior point of where I am. If it was a group of bikies, I don't think charging forward on them would have been a good move. But if it's a one-on-one -on -one violent attack, you want to regain that initiative. If it's an animal attacking you, it depends. Sometimes you want to be stationary, sometimes you want to run towards some type of cover. For example, a building where you can shut a door or a vehicle where you can climb inside. And other times, perhaps you need to stand your ground and strike the animal that's attacking you, like a rooster, for example. Roosters can be pretty scary, especially when you're a kid. When you've got a violent big bird coming towards you, it can actually traumatize kids for a long time. When you're an adult, you might carry that trauma, but if you can recognize the trauma and you see a violent animal coming towards you, that one swift kick may protect you or your loved ones, you need to make your move. Which links to when to move. Should you move now, later, or never? In most instances, when it's an immediate threat, you have to move now. A car's moving towards you, you've got to get out of the way. A violent offender strikes you or threatens you, you've got to take him out quickly if you have the skills. A dog is attacking you and its handler advises you not to move, then you shouldn't move. Those are immediate threats, but now I want you to think of survival threats. That is, you're in your home, all hell has broken loose, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's riots on the streets. Do you move? Sometimes, no. Sometimes you want to stay in your fortress and wait. Other times, as we've discussed with the rules of survival, mobility is key. And if you don't move, you will die. But then if you're on foot, as an example, if you were in a desert and it was hot and you didn't have much water, moving in the middle of the day is a really, really stupid idea. In that example, it's best to actually move at night. It's cooler. You can navigate by the stars if you know what you're doing. You can conserve energy. You can conserve water. You can reduce your chance of exposure eliminate sunstroke, reduce dehydration, conserve your water, and so forth. Conversely, if you are in a cold environment, moving at night can be a really bad idea, particularly if there's thick clouds where you can't navigate by the stars, there's a lot of wind and rain increasing your chance of hypothermia, and you're in a group which could increase the chances of being separated. These are all things to consider when it comes to your protection and location. What's going to kill you first? Where are you? Where should you move and when do you move? 
All of this will be made easier if you consider what you should stock and what you should carry. There are two parts to this. As an infantry soldier, you carry your life on your back. So what I carry in my home and in my garage and in my survival setup is vastly different to what I carry when I'm on patrol. Essentially, all of my luxuries disappear when I'm on patrol and I only take the necessary items that will keep me alive. The number one thing as a soldier is ammo and water. Everything else is a bonus. That's not to say I don't carry other stuff. It's just to say that when you're a soldier and I figure out what is going to kill me first, it's likely the enemy. Therefore, to protect myself, I need ammo. But if I'm just hiking through the woods, I have to consider what's going to kill me first. A bear? Probably not if I'm in Australia, but yes, probably if I'm in parts of America. So when you're stationary, you have the opportunity to have a lot more stock that will help you survive. Being stationary is an absolute luxury. When you move, you have to reduce what you've stocked down to what you can carry. And what you carry depends on where you are and what will kill you first. Obviously, if I'm in the desert, I'm not going to take a winter grey jacket. Yes, it gets cold at night, even in deserts, but I'd much rather carry water than thick sleeping bags. Conversely, if I was in the snow, I'd much rather carry cold weather gear than too much water, particularly if I had the ability to melt snow and create water that was all around me. Ultimately, when it comes to survival, you need to keep thinking so you can adapt to your environment. Even if you want to go into extreme survival situations, look at what Bear Grylls does. He shows you all of these different environments in which he trains and in which he survives. Those are blatant examples of what I learn in the snow is different to the desert compared to the jungle compared to urban and so forth. Figure out where you are to understand what you have to stock when you're stationary compared to what you can carry when you're mobile. Which naturally leads into what you should stock when it comes to protection. So first of all, food and water. We'll go into that in the next video. Today we're really talking about protection. And the first part is what can kill you. So I want you to think big. I don't want you just to think of hunger and thirst. I want you to again think about the environment in which you're in. Then you move into what can protect you. What can protect you is relevant to which environment you're in. So we're going to go over safety, medical, and weapons. Noting the platform we're on, I unfortunately can't talk too much about weapons, even in a survival situation. But we can dive deep into safety and medical. Okay, safety. Going back to where you are, you need maps and a compass. Now, unfortunately, most people don't know how to read a map or how to use a compass, which goes back to the last video of doing what is hard when it's easy. Learn now. If you do not know how to use a map, figure it out. Now, if you're thinking, why do I need a map when I'm just surviving in my own home? Again, surviving in your own home is an absolute luxury. Sometimes you're going to have to move, and sometimes it's going to be beyond an area that you're familiar with. It may be beyond your suburb or your city. Being stationary in survival is an absolute luxury. Even staying in your little hood, street, suburb, city is also a luxury. If you have to move, you need to understand where you're moving. And part of that is having a map and being able to read it and being able to orientate that map. If you don't know how to navigate by the sun and the stars, which in itself is a very impressive skill, a compass can make life a lot easier. And if you're thinking you have a compass on your phone, no, I'm talking about an analog compass. And I'm also talking about an analog map. That is a piece of paper and a physical compass. You may never need to use it, but it's much easier to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. This actually links into comms. In survival, as I discussed in the rules of survival in the prior video, alliances dominate. Now that alliance might be with your neighbor, it might be with a street with a street, a suburb with another suburb, a city with a city, a country with another country. Alliances dominate. And part of that alliance is communications. Forget your mobile phone. It's gone, the whole network is down. Unless it's a short, immediate survival situation where you can call mum to come and rescue you. Pretty low key, we're going a little bit deeper than that. When it comes to communication and alliances, you actually need to do what's hard when it's easy and build those alliances now. And you also need to figure out how you're going to communicate with those alliances. Consider, all mobile phone towers will be out, there's no postal service, and you'll need to communicate quickly if they're right next to you, you can talk. 
If you're hiding, maybe you need to do some type of sign language. All soldiers learn field signals so they can communicate silently together, together in a close vicinity. Beyond that, all soldiers learn how to use radios. As a civilian, I recommend you invest in something like this. It looks small, compact and simple, but this is a top of the line radio that has significant range, multiple channels and good battery life. When we're talking about batteries, you also have to figure out how you're going to charge those batteries. Do you have other batteries that you can plug into? And if so, how are they charged? Go down the chain of every item you use, such as a radio, what does that plug into? What does that plug into? And where is that getting the electricity from? Once you start mapping this out and doing what's hard when it's easy, as I keep saying, you'll find that something like this can save your life. Whether it's communicating with an emergency service that may or may not be in the area, or communicating with your alliances that can help you move a casualty, or you can move to them with stocks and vice versa, comms are key when it comes to safety and survival. You also need to think about clothing. So I have multiple sets of different type of clothing for different environments. Ultimately, when it comes to survival, I don't recommend shorts and a t-shirt. That is an absolute modern luxury in the sense that when you're surviving and are exposed to the elements, hot or cold, unless you've been raised in an environment such as indigenous people who are toughened and raised in the environment where they don't actually need that much clothing, if you are suddenly thrown into an environment where you need to survive, where you don't have a roof, you don't have a car, you don't have air conditioning, you don't have heating, and you're always in the sun, the rain, the wind, shorts and a t-shirt are a really bad idea. Obviously, if it's cold, you need cold weather gear, but if it's hot, I actually recommend still long sleeves and long pants. Just look at what soldiers wear when they are in the desert. Very hot environment, but they're not going around shirtless unless it's a Hollywood movie. You're covered up so you're protected from the elements, whether it's hot or cold. Remember, as wind flies through, it's also carrying debris. Insects bite which is an absolute mental and physical distraction when you're in a survival situation. The better the clothes you wear, the easier it is to survive. And if you're not sure what clothes to get, go to a camping store and don't cheap out. Also think you don't actually need 10 pairs of pants. In my soldiering years, I wore the same set of cams out bush for up to six weeks at a time. Yes, it stinks. Yes, it's gross. Doesn't matter. You're still surviving. You change out your socks, jocks and t-shirt, but your external clothes, you can just wear them for weeks, months, even years if you have to. Consequently, you want to make sure that you're getting good quality stuff. Don't cheap out on the clothes that you're getting. Which links to boots. Military history shows us that one of the biggest cause of casualties on the front line wasn't in fact bombs or bullets. It was hygiene and feet. Hygiene when we talk about personal hygiene and infection, which we'll explore a bit later. But trench foot and the extreme hardships that your feet go through, whether it be in a trench or walking long distances, your feet are everything in survival. Even if it's short-term survival, if something falls on your feet, no matter how strong, fit, and prepared you are, if you can't walk, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Which actually links to one of the rules that I told you in my last video. The weak are liabilities. And if you have no feet or a damaged foot, you are a liability. And if you are a liability, you may be left behind or unable to protect yourself. So in a survival situation, Think of steel cap boots in the workplace or military boots on the battlefield. For me, even in summer, I hate wearing flip-flops when I'm driving, just in case there is some type of emergency where I have to get out of the car and do something. In fact, truth be told, I hate wearing flip-flops at all for this reason. I hate the thought of having to run or move quickly or go to ground or rescue someone or rescue myself whilst wearing flip-flops, which is why at a minimum, I always wear good running shoes. But when I'm out bush or doing something difficult, I have very good hiking boots or military boots. I recommend you invest in a good set of shoes and walk them in now so they become comfortable for when you need them. Of course, when it comes to safety, everyone's talking about PPE, personal protection equipment. You need to protect your hands. In my early days of soldiering, they never issued gloves. You had to go out and buy your own gloves. And then when you did buy your own gloves, your mates would often give you crap for wearing them. I didn't care. I knew I needed my hands. I always protected them with good gloves. Gloves are a double-edged weapon. If they're too thick and bulky, you lose dexterity in handling weapons and doing things where you need to have some type of tactile or agile function of your fingers. 
Conversely, if they're too thin, they tear easily and don't provide any protection. The good news is, is that material technology has advanced so significantly that there are in fact a lot of good gloves out there. If you're in a cold environment, it's pretty obvious why you need gloves. But in a hot environment, it's also protecting the back of your hands from exposure and the front of your hands, or the inside of your palms, from any type of rope burn, bites, cuts, blisters, and so forth, all of which make you weaker and therefore a liability. Blisters can be a real killer in survival. Sure, they hurt and they're uncomfortable, but if they split and get infected, something as simple as not wearing a pair of gloves has now led to a blood infection that makes you injured, weak, a liability, and out of the survival game. The same is true with goggles or glasses. I want you to think about a police force going through and wearing goggles in their building clearances. They're not wearing those goggles because they look cool. They're wearing those goggles because one tiny piece of fragment that ends up in their eye can take them out of the fight and make them a liability as opposed to an asset. In building clearances or urban survival when you're fighting, anything that goes into your eye can blind you and if you can't see, nothing else matters unless you have the luxury of someone holding your hand and taking you away from the danger. In hot environments, sunglasses protect your eyes not only from the sun and from dust to an extent, it also protects you from fatigue and headaches. Just imagine shining a bright light in your eyes for an hour compared to not having that bright light in your eyes for an hour. Which one is going to be easier to deal with? In sunny conditions, sunglasses make a huge difference. The same is true in snowy conditions. A lot of light comes off snow. Sunglasses are key to reducing your fatigue so you can move on longer and not become a liability to yourself and others. As for helmets, any helmet will actually do. Sure, if you're a soldier, there's ballistic helmets that have some type of ballistic protection, but even a bicycle helmet can provide immense protection when you're fleeing a situation and you're in a car that could crash, if you're running and you could trip over, if you're in a violent or unstable environment where someone is throwing a rock at you or hitting you with a bat, you'd be amazed at protection a helmet can provide you. Any helmet can extend your survivability rates. Obviously, the better the helmet, the better the survivability. But no helmet is made for all situations. You've got helmets for construction sites, for combat, for riding, for driving. The danger with helmets is that if they're too bulky, they obviously become very heavy. They can get caught on things, but they can also reduce your hearing and peripheral vision. So helmets are a double-edged weapon. I still recommend in any survival situation where you're moving through a hostile environment, wear a helmet. What type of helmet becomes a luxury of what you can afford to buy now, what you can stock where you're prepping, and which one you choose to carry if you have to move. And then you have masks. I'm not talking about the mask that we're wearing for the beer flu. I'm talking about a good gas mask that can protect you from foreign contamination, whether that be biological, chemical, or simply dust from the environment. If you're moving through a very dusty environment after a building collapse, if you're moving through a dusty environment such as a desert or an area that has a lot of foreign debris in the air, gas masks can be the difference between life and death. You don't know what's in that air, particularly after a building collapses. Think of all of the stuff that was in the building, right down to sewage pipes, and you start breathing it in now, that can lead to infection later. Gas masks are expensive, difficult to obtain, and need filter changes. And if you have family members who need them, it can become quite a big investment. There is no black and white answer for this, but I do suggest you all get some type of breathing apparatus that will provide you survivability for at least 60 minutes. That 60 minutes could be the difference between life and death. And that's why I want you to think about stationary versus mobile. No, not stationary as pens and papers, or mobile as in a phone. I want you to think about you staying in your house versus moving. So when you're in your house, it should be like your fortress, depending where you are. If you're in an apartment, I wish you luck. But if you're on a good property where you can build up a good fortress around you, you can stockpile a lot of stuff. But that, of course, is very luxurious. Survival when you're sitting still is way easier than survival when you're mobile. But if you are mobile, I've just simply put Land Cruiser there. Why? Because if you were forced to survive during a zombie apocalypse type situation, what type of vehicle would you want to be in? And to cut straight to the chase, the answer is a Land Cruiser. Don't worry about other brands. Don't worry about what Jono said. The truth is, unless you're in a military fighting vehicle, the best vehicle for survivability when you have to move is a Toyota Land Cruiser 
end of story. What you put in that vehicle is limited by the space and the range. That is, the more stuff you carry, the heavier it is and the less fuel you can carry. You should have fuel jerry cans ready around your house at any time. The issue with fuel is that when you fill those jerry cans, they start to get a bit of an expiry date. Petroleum versus diesel. Diesel has a longer shelf life than petroleum and diesel has a longer range than petroleum. Ultimately, when it comes to survival, diesel is better for those two reasons. It has a longer shelf life and it will take you further. And if you're thinking about getting a generator, which you should for your fortress, I would recommend you get a diesel generator over a petrol one. You're gonna need less fuel, it'll put out more power and last longer. Why do people get petrol generators? Why do people get petrol vehicles? They're cheaper, but nothing can deny the reality of diesel having a longer shelf life, putting out more torque, using less fuel. If it were not true, trucks would not be running on diesel and massive generator farms would not be running on diesel either. Look at what the experts do and apply it to your survival situation. Then we go into mobile on foot. Luckily for me, I have a lot of years of experience of what it's like being mobile on foot. That is carrying everything I need in my pack to survive without any resupplies. But even when I'm mobile, without the resup of water, within about three days, I'm a dead man and water is heavy. So when it comes to being mobile on foot, you need to think about the cover from the elements, essentially a hoochie or some type of tarp that you can use to cover you just from rain and frost. That's pretty much it. Don't worry about walls and zip up tents. That is all a luxury. When you're mobile, you need something that will protect you from the elements, what you're wearing, some type of hoochie, a hat, sunglasses, most of the stuff that you can wear, such as boots and gloves that will keep you protected from the elements. If you've got something in your pack, you'll need water, which we'll talk about in future videos, or some type of purification method so you can purify water that you find. Also, don't forget you need vessels to carry that water. If you're in a survival situation and you happen to have a bottle of water and you finish that bottle of water, do not throw out the bottle. Keep the bottle. Why? Because when you rock up to a water source and you drink from that water source, but then you have to keep moving, how are you going to store that water? I know that might sound pretty obvious to some people, but the amount of times I've seen people throw out water vessels that could have carried water in the future because they didn't want to carry an empty piece of plastic is just mind boggling. And finally, fire. This is probably my greatest survival bit of kit. A three pack of lighters. Fire took mankind thousands of years to understand and harness. And now we have this cheap piece of technology that we can purchase from the supermarket for five bucks that at a flick of a switch, we can create fire. Of course, fire creates light and heat and comfort, but it can also purify water and cook food. Moreover, that three pack of lighters can be a currency where I can exchange it for goods and services with other people in my alliance. Never underestimate the importance of lighters. Yes, you can get fireproof matches. Yes, you can get flints. Yes, you can get magnifying glasses to make fire, but take it from the guy who tried to figure out the best way to do it for years. The best way to make fire is with a lighter. And even when that lighter runs out of gas, you still have a flint that you can create sparks with that can create a fire. If there's only one thing you take from this lesson, next time you're at the supermarket, get a three pack of lighters. Not one, but a three pack. And the reason why I emphasize a three pack is because if I had to barter in a survival situation, he who I'm bartering with can see that that is a brand new sealed lighter. If it's not brand new and sealed, they can't be sure how much gas is in there. Yes, they could hold it up to light, but a sealed three pack of lighters becomes very powerful. Beyond lighters, of course, think of torches, two types, one that you can carry in your hand and one you can carry on your head. The one on your head is probably more important because it frees up your hands to continue in your survival situation. But the truth is, once you're actually in a real survival situation, you never actually need a torch. For over 10 years in a combat role, I never used a torch. And we did a lot of operations at night. You can adapt to night operations without using a torch. More importantly, you don't actually want to use a torch because it destroys your night vision. If you don't know what I mean, think about when you're in your home and you turn off the light. For the first minute or so, you can't see anything. Then your eyes adjust to the low light conditions and you can see quite well. The same as when you're out bush. If anyone turns on a torch when you're out bush, everyone loses their night vision. 
That's why night fighting is a bit of an art. When you're fighting at night and there's flashes and bombs and bullets and flares going off, there's so many things happening that are killing your night vision. That's why the best soldiers will actually be able to flick between one eye shut and one eye open. It does mess with your depth, but it protects essentially your vision purple. The fluid in your eye that helps you see in low light conditions and is destroyed with bright lights. You want to conserve your ability to see at night. And part of doing that is by not using a torch. So believe it or not, a torch can actually last you many many months if not years out bush if you're only using it in extreme situations finally when we talk about safety weapons are involved but we'll talk about that a little bit later now we go into medical most people don't consider this in survival they stock up their food their water their torches but they don't actually think about medical and the first thing that you want to consider is a compression bandage band-aids and gauze this single piece of material is probably the greatest bit of first aid kit you can carry out there. It can strap sprains, stop bleeds, be used as slings, convert it into rope. This can do many things, including saving lives. You can also use it to wash yourself in extreme conditions, then wash it, then dry it, reuse it. You need a good set of compression bandages in your first aid kit. Band-aids and plasters for my British viewers are also quite important. Very important when it comes to not just cuts but actually protecting blisters. Remember when you're working outside, digging a hole, pulling rope, lifting people, doing something repetitively and you get a blister. If that blister pops and becomes infected, something small can move into something big. Hopefully you've got gloves on that will protect you from getting a blister, but if you do get a blister or a cut or a graze, you've got a good set of band-aids. And when I say a good set of band-aids, don't get the 99 cent set of band-aids, get the $6 packet. Get the best packet of band-aids you can possibly find. They have a better shelf life, they stick better, you can get waterproof ones, don't go cheap on band-aids. And of course, gauze. Gauze is essentially padding or a sponge that you can use to help stop bleeding. But gauze, honestly, is a bit of a luxury. A compression bandage in extreme situations will take care of it. If you have the room for gauze and you can stockpile, make sure you get some gauze along with your band-aids and compression bandages. The next thing is saline solution and antiseptic. Truth be told, these two pieces of kit are my primary pieces of medical equipment that I take out with me anywhere at any time. This saline solution is simply just clean water. As soon as I'm dealing with a cut on myself or someone else, I irrigate the cut with one of these, which does two things. Obviously it cleans it, but it enables me to see the injury. That is when you've got someone who's got a serious cut, sometimes you can't actually see the cut because there's blood everywhere. So the first thing I'm reaching for beyond my medical gloves is my saline solution. I need to clean and irrigate that area so I can get any foreign debris out of it and see what I'm dealing with. That then helps me determine what type of, if any, gauze I'm using and the compression bandage, how I'm applying it and where I'm applying it. The second part of that, of course, is antiseptic. As I mentioned before, we've discovered throughout wars, the biggest casualty causer on the battlefield. And when I say casualty, it may be killing the soldier or just taking them out of the fight. It was infection and foot rot. Part of the reason why we live so long now compared to what we did hundreds if not thousands of years ago is because we've figured out how to fight infection. Not just on skin, but within our body. But the first on-ramp for that infection could be a cut. And in a survival situation, if you're stuck at home or out bush or in an urban environment where you can't get to the doctor, you're on your own. So make sure you've got a little bit of antiseptic. And equally, make sure you've got essential meds. Most of us don't need this. I'm blessed in the sense that I don't have any essential meds that I need daily to keep me alive. But if you're a diabetic and you need insulin as an example, in a survival situation, you become very vulnerable. Reduce your vulnerability by stockpiling whatever medicines you need now. Diabetes is just one example I've given. There are countless medical conditions out there where you're going to need ongoing medical treatment or medications to keep you alive. And I'm sorry to say, if you are one of those people, you are weak and you are a liability in a survival situation. I'm not saying that to offend you, I'm saying it as a matter of fact. That is why when we recruit people in the military, we openly discriminate against those who have those type of conditions. If you have an issue with that, take it up with your military or your government to say, why do you discriminate against me? But it's because in a survival situation, which is what most soldiers face on a battlefield, if you need insulin or something daily, you become a liability to everyone who's on the battlefield. Therefore, those people are not recruited into combat positions or even in the military at large. I know this is confronting, but that is just the truth. If you have a medical condition, you become a liability. 
Reduce your liability on yourself and others by stockpiling that stuff now. But be prepared for what comes when you run out of those medical supplies. I want you to also consider soap, clothes and baby wipes as medical treatment in the sense that soap is pretty obvious, washing your hands and your body when you can to maintain hygiene, reduce infection and feel good. There's nothing better than having a shower after four to six weeks out bush. Believe me, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world. But when it comes to clothes, if you have to move, you're not gonna need three jackets. You're not gonna need five pairs of jeans. But what you will need is socks, jocks and undershirts. If you have three pairs, one that is clean, one that is wearing, one that's been washed and drying, you'll be okay. That's essentially how it works. Your socks, jocks, and undershirt, and for girls that would include your bra, you've got one set that you're wearing, one set that you're carrying ready to change out, and one set that you've washed and is drying somewhere. As an example, with my socks as a soldier, if I found some type of water source, I'd wash my socks in that water source, hang them off the back of my pack, and then as I was patrolling, my socks would not only be drying, but to an extent, sterilized in the sun. Sure, it's not gonna be as great as using a washing machine, but this is survival. If you're stationary, you'll be lucky to hang them out to dry in a semi-clean environment. If you're mobile, they might be drying in a dust storm, as an example. It's just the fact of survival. When it comes to cleaning your clothes, it's very limited. Now, baby wipes I've put in there, that you might refer to them as wet wipes. They're a luxury because they're one-time use and you throw them out. But as a soldier, in my early years, all field showers was essentially a piece of torn towel, no bigger than this. You'd use your water bottle, do a quick wipe over your body, and that was essentially your shower. Modern soldiers often use baby wipes because you, they're clean, they smell pretty, and you wipe them over your body and you throw them out. But if you're in a survival situation where there's an enemy, you don't use them because they have a scent, and the enemy can pick up that scent quite easily. So baby wipes are a bit of a luxury, but something that you might like to consider as a form of keeping clean or having a field shower. So those are must-haves with medical, but nice-haves include antibiotics and painkillers. Painkillers are something that are easy to stockpile now and they're also good for trading. So remember in a survival situation if you have allies or you're working with other groups you may be able to trade lighters, painkillers or whatever for something that you need. These all become currencies. Antibiotics are also really important. We've spoken about antiseptic, which is essentially at the skin level, but antibiotics are essentially at the blood level. Sure, there are many different antibiotics that should be issued by doctors, but in a survival situation, if you're dead anyway, you take the antibiotic you've got. Because if you don't, you're dead anyway. I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you what antibiotics to take. I'm just saying that in a survival situation, normal rules go out the window. Start with antiseptic and keeping your body clean and sealed. What do I mean by sealed? Avoid cuts by wearing gloves, good clothing and goggles and a helmet as required. However, then when you are cut, use saline solution or antiseptic to clean, irrigate and sterilize the area. But then if you do get an infection, a nice have is antibiotics and painkillers, which actually leads on to aloe and skin creams. When I was doing my officer training after being a soldier for many years, I remember I had a task where I had to dig in a communication line between all the pits within a harbour. And even after years of soldiering and being very experienced in what I was doing, I got severely sunburnt on this task. I was on my hands and knees all day digging a trench to run communication lines and the back of my neck got so burnt I was in absolute agony. Thank God one of my fellow officer trainees had some aloe gel in his pack and I don't even know why he had it there. After years of soldiering, I had never considered it. But without that aloe, I was a dead man. I was in absolute agony. I would argue I had at least second degree burns to the back of my neck and that aloe vera cream changed my life. It's now something I always carry in my pack because when you've been exposed to the sun and you're burnt, even if it's just a small burn from the sun, that aloe can change everything. Combined with the painkillers and any skin creams, antiseptic creams, moisturizing creams, lip balm. Lip balm is a big one when you've been exposed to the sun and your lips are split and hurt. You also want to consider sunscreen. All of these things will protect you and increase your survivability. They're nice haves, but if you're stockpiling stuff now, include it in your survival kit and it changes everything when you're in a survival situation. Of course, everything we list here can be used as a currency when trading between tribes or communities. Finally, female hygiene products. Now, I realize this might make some people uncomfortable, deal with it. As I used to say to my officer trainees when I was instructing them, as a woman, you need to know this because you'll be dealing with it. And as a man, you need to know this because you'll have women under your command or in your team who are dealing with it. The quickest casualty causer of women in the field 
is UTIs, urinary tract infections. The mechanics of it, shorter urethra, more exposed to infection, the number one casualty causer of women in the field. If you're in an urban survival situation, you probably don't even think about this, but the reality is your sanitary products are a one-time use, and once they're gone, they're gone. Out in the field, if you're using the wrong sanitary products, or you don't have enough, you're going to very quickly be exposed to a UTI, you become sick, weak, vulnerable, a liability, and all the things you don't want to think about right now when it comes to staying alive. Yes, snowflakes, men and women are different. Deal with it. Ladies, if you don't have enough female hygiene products, you stand to make yourself very vulnerable in the future. And when it comes to those products, here are the cold hard facts. If you have to walk a long distance and you're wearing pads, particularly with wings, you're exposing yourself to chafing and blisters. If you are in a dirty environment and you're using tampons without an applicator, you're exposing yourself to an infection when inserting. Consequently, you need to consider every time you change out a tampon during a menstrual cycle, you want to ensure your hands are clean before, during and after. You also want to consider using tampons with an applicator so you don't increase the likelihood of exposure to infection. If you are not menstruating, you may like to consider panty liners for something that you can change out regularly to keep the area clean because ultimately Ultimately, in those type of survival situations, the area should be treated as a wound. What does that mean? Clean, dry, and regular changing of dressings. If you think this is weird having a bloke talking to you about this, I don't care. In a survival situation, if you're in my tribe or community, I need to ensure that you've got that sorted out so you don't become a liability to me later. Ladies, you need to have this discussion with your girlfriends, your daughters, and your friends right now. Men, Guess what? Same thing. Because in a survival situation, UTIs don't care. They're just infections. And something as simple as failing to change out a panty liner, failing to use an applicator, failing to consider what happens when you menstruate, something that is so simple in a peacetime normal situation can quickly evolve into an infection, bringing you and your colleagues down as you are unable to move and they are forced to support you. You also need to consider in a long-term survival situation, all of your first world luxury products that you have now quickly run out and then you're into primitive forms of material that you will have to wash and reuse over and over again. As a way to prepare, I would recommend buying reusable pads that you can buy at the moment. They do exist. Many women use them and many women have been using them for years. If you don't want to use them, make sure you have enough products to carry you over during the period of survival. Probably a poor choice of word there. The other thing to consider with pads though, if you do have sanitary pads, they are very good as a type of gauze for other injuries. That is, if you have a cut on your arm and you have limited medical supplies, a sanitary pad can be used as an absorbent and pad to ironically capture the blood and when applied with pressure, stop the bleeding and then to maintain that cut later on to be used as dressing that you can change out later. So every first aid kit, whether you're male or female, should in fact have some sanitary pads in it for that reason. Whether a female needs it for her cycle or you need it as a dressing or gauze, they double up as both. So let's summarize protection and location in the survival series video. Firstly, I need you to identify where you are to determine your next move. That is, what will kill you first? I want you to also start building your stocks now for being stationary and mobile. Everything that you need when you're mobile, you can be stockpiling while you're stationary, but not everything that you have for when you're stationary can be used for when you're mobile. That is, you can't carry a generator on your back, but you could carry batteries and a small solar panel in your pack. Make sure you understand when you're building your stocks, the difference between being stationary and being mobile. Finally, don't forget your medical supplies. Basic, compression bandage, and saline. Complex, antiseptic, painkillers, antibiotics, a tourniquet if you know how to use them, and feminine, all the female hygiene products we've just discussed. In our next video, we'll be going over water, then food, and then I'll throw in another video that'll wrap it all together. If you've got any questions or comments, please do leave them below. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I'm Adam Stokes, thanks for listening, happy prepping, and I'll talk to you next time.